there. <laughs> How is that? Leave some, leave some for me. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yes, I'll leave some for you. Yeah, they are yours. Oh, am I in the show? Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> I suppose I'm in the show now. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, it's me, Matt. We're uh, doing a little uh, Q&A and live panel. Uh, the host is uh, getting off of one panel, and there he is. <laughs> Wait, nope. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Hey, Matt. It's been a busy day here at Kaiju Masterclass, so. Um... Yeah. That's what I've been hearing. <laughs> Dude, I didn't know there were shirts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you go to kaijumasterclass.com, you can actually go out there. We have a thing on Redbubble. Um, awesome. Hey, we have – I have a coffee mug that I've been using this week. We have oh, all kinds of crazy stuff out there. So it's uh, – oh, just so everybody knows, all the money for that basically is going to pay for any expense we've had for, for this uh, online convention. We're not, like, really making anything on it. But it's made available if you want to rock the merch. We definitely appreciate it. Yeah, totally. I, I will probably be indulging in that myself a little bit. Um, I'm just going to uh, share the link in a few different places, and that should be all we need to do. I know you and I talked about that a little bit, but uh, my sister Cassie is here, by the way. She's been helping me in the live streams. Say hi. hi. Yeah, I was going to say. Hello. Say hi. <laughs> all right. Um, let me get my document pulled up. Like I said, I just ended the other one, so we'll get rocking here in just a, a second. No worries. Matt, do you have any cool projects you're like working on right now that you can talk about? Uh, good question. I am, um, let me think for a second. I am, what can I talk about? Not much. Contest you entered? <laughs> oh yeah, I entered the main illustration, the main image contest for Tokyo Comic Con. Uh, my contact with Tokyo Comic Con, Matt Nakamura, has been kind of after me to do that for kind of since the show started. And he uh, finally convinced me to do it this year, mostly because it's going to be all online and I have the time to do it. <laughs> so I went ahead and, and did it. Don't know if they'll use it, but I'm really proud of it. And I'm, I'm hoping I can show it off sometime soon. But he said to keep it under wraps for the moment. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I have... I have a list of questions, Matt. We're going to kind of go through this. And as I'm talking, you feel free to start your the drawing and we can just kind of go go from there. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds fine. Let me ask you, though, just so we uh, cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's. Is my audio coming through OK? Yeah, sound great. Okay. At least on my end, I can't speak for YouTube at the moment, but it sounds good to me. Well, I've had a little problem with that in the past. So let me double check just to be sure. And then I can... Uh, I will take my and my phone and put it over here on the little mount so I can work on my sketch. Uh, uh, where to go? Where to go? Where to go? Where to go? Oh, I can just copy paste it because I literally just did that. Uh, yeah. Other than that, I've got a bunch of stuff going on that I just can't. So let me double check. There we go. We're good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me do a little rotationally. Oh, let's see here. So I, there, while you get set up, I'm going to put myself on the screen. Uh, okay. So my first question, Matt, is how did you start your career as an artist? Uh, I began my career, uh, I was a young boy in England. And no, that's usually my go-to. Uh, not true. I, whoops, one second. Uh, I just need to uh, check the, ah, there we go. That's what I needed. Okay, that should work. All right, that's not too sideways or anything for anybody. Can folks, I hopefully folks can see that. I think it looks good. All right, great, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, I got started like you know a, a lot of kids. I really wanted to draw. I loved drawing as a kid. You know, a lot, a lot of kids. Uh, often I say that when kids draw, uh, it's it's just something for them to do with their hands, and it keeps them off the streets, and uh, all that good stuff. And it's just it's just something fun and and tactile for kids to be able to do but uh i didn't really decide that this was what i wanted to do as my career until uh not really until closer to high school when i realized because i because originally as a kid i was like i want to be a paleontologist i want to be a paleontologist i want to be a paleontologist and then i think i found out that paleontologists don't make a whole lot of money <laughs> so then i became an artist <laughs> Uh, Doesn't that have the same problem? <laughs> oh yeah, totally, man. 
I, t- I mean, I think I think we all slowly start to realize that. But uh, really, when it, in high school is when I realized, like, I just I liked being creative. And I especially like the idea of like making stories and also just getting to draw the things that I liked and the things I want to draw. So that was sort of the genesis of how I got to where I am, especially because I was a really big manga fan. And a lot of the manga that I used to read would be um, like the, the narrative usually goes that a lot of manga start off as uh, oh, this one creator who had this vision for a story. And uh, is the, is it still framed? Okay. Um, yeah, it's lagging, so. Oh, it's a little laggy. Okay. Um, is that the, the, the one creator will have a vision for a story and then um, they will just they'll make their comic and make it the way they want to make it. And obviously the Japanese comic book industry is a lot more complicated than that. But uh, uh, still, though, I really got into comics and, and like uh, more than just manga. I got into American comics in college and really decided that was what I wanted to do, which was ironic because the college I went to was vehemently against comic book art. Like I uh, often people tend to. Uh, have a pretty major reaction when I tell them that uh, I got like C's and D's in a lot of my art classes <laughs> in college. So let me let me ask you this, um, kind of in that same vein, what or who, what or who would you say are your biggest influences in general? Well, often people uh, say I'm the poor man, poor man's art Adams, and I feel like that is the most accurate description <laughs> of who I am as an artist. Um, I mean, I was, I was hugely inspired by the Art Adams Godzilla comic book covers for Dark Horse. Yep. Uh, those covers, specific, I mean, the comics themselves, were those were the first comics I ever collected, where I'm like, I'm going to get from point A to point B, I'm going to get, uh, I'll try to get all of these. And that really opened it up to where I started looking into the old 70s Marvel Godzilla comics, which got me into 70s Marvel comics, like Devil Dinosaur and the Avengers and stuff. And then, uh, especially into college, by the time I got to college, you know, I, I started branching out, like I said. But uh, another big influence for me is Ricardo Delgado, because he, the way he draws dinosaurs, especially they're, uh, in his Age of Reptiles graphic novel, there's so much character and personality in those dinosaurs. And that deeply influenced how I draw dinosaurs and monsters and stuff uh i mean i have let me let me ask you let me ask you this can you let's let's talk about the comic drawing process and how you actually go through that to match a story how does that actually work how much input do you have doing the artwork to match a story what what comes first and how much input you actually have to be able to maybe hey make a suggestion here or there well uh seems to me a fairly typical process is being able to say like because usually what will happen is if you're just an artist on a book and you're not a writer you'll get the script and your job is to interpret the writer's script but depending on the writer you have they may give you some leeway to throw in some little details like um uh which one is it uh batman the killing joke is uh uh, is fairly well known for the artist uh, in, t- adding a lot to Alan Moore's script and adding in a lot of little details like stuff that are on uh, people's desks and things like that. At least that's the way I had heard it. Uh, so sometimes it is an artist's responsibility to say like, hey, this page has too many panels. I can combine these two panels into one panel. And then other times it's a, it, it is a really, really deeply collaborative process where you'll co-conceptualize a story with a writer like I did with uh, Godzilla Rulers of Earth. How much back and forth is there? So let's say you're given this script, you make a drawing, is there a lot of back and forth between, oh, I didn't, I don't like this, or you did this wrong or anything like that? Uh, for the most part in my career, I have not gotten a whole lot of like fix it notes where you're getting notes from people, uh, notes from uh, uh, from the writers or the producers. Sometimes you'll get that a little bit, but for the most part, the writers I've worked with have been very chill and very easy to work with. And it's kind of rare that I will get like, we don't like, uh, we don't like this, or we don't like the way this character is drawn. You try to iron a lot of that out in the early st- planning stages. It's sort of like storyboarding for a movie. So 
talk to me about um, timeline. So you're given a script. How, how far out is the deadline for you to actually turn something in? And then how far from there does it actually go to print? Oh, man, it's uh, it, it can get pretty tight. It's where you're kind of like, like uh, Rulers of Earth is a really good example of an extremely tight turnaround because uh, the the scripts had to be approved by Toho. And on top of that, you had all this extra pressure to, uh, you also have to keep in mind printing schedules and how far in advance something needs to be solicited for uh, Diamond, which is the main comics distributor in the United States. And so I would say, for example, a Godzilla book, we were getting the script. Chris Mowry was getting the script to us uh, with, with me and Jeff Zorno and Priscilla Tremontano. We would get the script kind of at, oftentimes at the beginning of the month because poor Chris was being worked to the bone over at IEW because he was also their like one of their lead graphic designers. So he's also having to turn around and write this comic every month. And we get the script at like uh, close to the end of the previous month. And then we would have a month to get the thing uh, draw uh, uh, thumbnailed, drawn, inked, and colored, and that's like 20 plus pages. And then uh, you have to have stuff get approved. So ideally, you're a few months ahead, like I would say three or four months ahead. But an ideal turnaround for a single issue is you try to have everything done within a month. <clears throat> So one of the things um, you, you're credited as both artist and writer for the Redman comic. Mm -hmm. Do those timelines change when you have to do both? Well, it, it, absolutely. Uh, there is a there's a real challenge to time management, as I'm sure a lot of artists and writers can sympathize with. And as a result, you've got like. I'm just trying to think of some specific examples. Okay. So like with red man, uh, I try to, so we have like a vague timeline. Okay. So with red man, it was a, like a volume a year basically, which is about five issues worth of work, but you're adding the script on top of that. And that can be, that can be really challenging because sometimes the script comes to you really organically. Other times, you're struggling and you're like, oh man, how do I solve for this? I have to make an outline first to try to, to figure out how the story is going to go. And it's just a huge pain in that. Can we curse? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, you probably, yeah. I mean, yeah. Within reason. A huge <laughs> pain in the behind and in the patootie. That's a fun one for me. <laughs> Cassie makes fun of me because I use a lot of old fashioned slang. Uh, it can be a real uh, pain in the rear end if you're if you're just trying to break something down and then thumbnail it out and then you realize partway through the process like I don't like how this is turning out I have to go rewrite this part of the story so then it can be a real challenge but the advantage I've had that not a lot of other artists have had is that I kind of make the schedule when it comes to Redman as long as it's done with enough time for Superaya to approve it then I kind of I kind of have my druthers and how I approach it, how I schedule it out, because I don't have That's to actually, worry about diamond distribu distribution. Yeah, so so that actually kind of ties into my next question. Talk about the approval process because you've done work for obviously you you've done work on Dai stuff, you've done work you know with Gamera, you've obviously done Redman, Superaya, and then you've worked with IDW and Godzilla. What is the approval process like? How much feedback do they give you and how long do they typically take to review and then approve your work? Um, well, since they're all coming from Japanese sources and Japanese companies, sometimes stuff has to go through a translation process and other times it doesn't. Other times they have English uh, speaking staff who uh, kind of have to shoulder the burden of being able to anticipate what their bosses will and won't approve. And it changes depending on the company. Subaraya is wonderfully easy to work with. Um, that's not to say there are some things that they don't approve of. Uh, I remember there was a particular panel in Redman Volume 1 that I had to change because it was too violent. And uh, one of their ethos is at Subaraya is they want to make sure the stuff is not uh, in any way inaccessible to children. 
uh, I mean, they can get a little risque with certain stuff. And obviously Japanese standards and practices are different from Americans. Uh, but there's just, uh, there's, it's just, it's, but it's a slightly different, uh, philosophy to it. Toho kind of famously is, uh, uh, very strict about how Godzilla and their properties are handled. And early on, I used to get a lot of notes. Uh, I would uh, not be drawing a monster's arms correctly. Uh, I remember the, one of the first notes I ever got was Godzilla's toenails are too sharp. <laughs> That's, um, so okay wait so, so they said you you basically couldn't draw his arm a specific way is there can you explain that a little bit more well that was rodan uh i drew okay. one of the first covers i ever did for idw was a poor because chris ryle the uh former editor-in-chief at idw he had this idea that the variant covers for kingdom of monster kingdom of monsters were going to be basically kaiju portraits and he just, and he wanted me to do like these cool portraits of each monster. And uh, I drew Fire Rodan as the first one. And the note I got back was like, you didn't draw his arm, you didn't draw his wings and his arms correctly. And they sent me some nice references and some magazine scans and stuff. And I'm like, oh, oh, Fire Rodan doesn't have elbows. It just has these straight out stick arms. <laughs> and they want their monsters to be pretty on model unless... Unless stylistically you are an art, sometimes they'll give some leeway to certain artists if they're a, have a very uh, if they have their own style and that's why they're hired. Like a lot of the artists who worked on the Criterion Godzilla set uh, had very particular styles, and uh, sometimes those styles aren't as um, they're not forced to adhere. But if you're gonna if you're gonna draw a monster accurately, it might as well be accurate. Uh, that seems to be the philosophy there. So did Toho give you a list of like specific mon specific versions of monsters? So for example, Kiryu Godzilla being mm -hmm. used in the IDW series, was that a specific choice made by IDW yourself? Was it made by Toho? Early on in the IDW days, uh, Toho uh, encouraged us to use more recent versions of the monsters because those are the versions that were, they considered more popular for international audiences because they didn't have, you know, that old fashioned look to them. They were uh, very, they were new and they were slick and cool. So that tended to be the default. And as the, as the years went on, they got a little more lax about that. And we started being able to like, use older versions of certain monsters and flip flop between older versions and newer versions. So uh, it, it just kind of depended on the project. A specific question in regards to rulers of earth. Can you talk about, um, was there a specific person that made the decision to have the Toho incarnation of Godzilla fight Godzilla 98? Uh, I, if I remember correctly, cause it's been a few years, I believe that was my idea because I said, Hey Chris, hey Chris, hey Chris, hey Chris, hey Chris. He's like, what, Matt? And I said, we have the rights to Godzilla 98, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in our last document that because that, they had to submit a list of monsters that they wanted to use. And Toho had to approve that list. And I said, you know what'll really uh set the fandom on fire is having Godzilla 98 be in like the first issue and then lead into a fight with with the Japanese Godzilla. And we just kind of went from there. Uh, we didn't quite get to put it front and center in the first issue because um, we, uh, this is a little uh, insider baseball. We had a leftover Art Adams cover of Gigan that he had just kind of made for fun. Uh, and, and IDW, you know, bought the rights off of him. And then the word we got from the, uh, editor was that we need to we need to use this cover because we paid a lot of money for this. <laughs> so get Gigan into the first issue somehow. <laughs> so uh, and I think Chris knocked it out of the park with that. But then uh, by issue two, we were able to like go ha go ham on this Godzilla versus Godzilla fight. So once you actually started writing the Godzilla comics, what was your approach to the story? How mindful of you were ha to having? you know, the human element, the human characters, along with lots and lots of monster action? Well, early on, uh, 
Okay, so uh, I when it, when it came to writing for the IDW Godzilla stuff, my contributions were relatively small. I was mostly uh, I, I mostly just kind of bounced ideas back and forth between myself and whoever I was working with, either uh, Jeremy Robinson or Chris Mowry or uh, Jeff Rosenkowski. And uh, the, the one with Jeff Rosenkowski, the, that's the that's Godzilla Legends uh, with Anguirus. That one was the most collaborative process because uh, Jeff and I uh, were bouncing ideas off of each other. But I always tried to make sure uh, or I always tried to encourage whoever I was working with that like, well, we need a we need a strong central human story that will mirror the monster action and complement the monster action in some way. Because the monsters are characters too, and we uh, we don't want the humans to just kind of get forgotten about or become pointless. Uh, I call it uh, standing on a roof syndrome, where at the end of say Godzilla and Mothra battle for the Earth or what have you, or Godzilla two thousand, which I like both of those movies, but the human characters essentially become uh, non entities at a point and. If they're standing on a roof watching the monsters fight. And that, to me, is... I'm sitting here having fun because I'm watching Godzilla knock Mothra around. Uh, and But at the same time, I'm like, oh, but then you look back on the older Honda days and you're like, no, Honda would literally write a contrivance into the plot to keep his characters doing stuff. He would just come up with something and be like, uh, there's a class stuck on this island and for no reason Godzilla and Mothra are fighting on this island and have the main characters get in a boat to go rescue the class so they don't get trampled. Like, just out of nowhere. And there's a kind of a beautiful brilliance to that. So... Uh, you gotta, you gotta, uh, uh, go less Heisei, more Honda, as I sometimes <laughs> <would> say. <laughs> I think, I think that's a, a good, uh, philosophy. So, I mean, it, it seems to me that, you know, Kaiju in general seem pretty difficult to adapt in a comic book medium, mainly because it's so cinematic just in nature. Mm. Would you say, A, that you agree with that? And then how, to, how do you actually attack that challenge? Um, I, I personally... I've never really had that problem because my brain is constantly tuned in to my brain is constantly tuned into, um, uh, into the Kaiju uh, space and how to whoops, dropping pens. Uh, it, my brain's constantly tuned into the Kaiju space and how to interpret that, um, uh, creatively and how to interpret that narratively. And, as a result, I just, I think that comics are a great medium for kaiju stories because you really can do just about anything in comics. There's a, a, a comics can be extremely cinematic. It just kind of depends on how they're written. And, you know, you can have these very cinematic uh, moments in a kaiju comic book, but in a lot of ways, a kaiju comic book also gives you more leeway to, uh, you can have more freedom. So, uh, kind of, kind of related question to that would be, um, what are the easiest kaiju to draw, and which would also be the most difficult? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I'm most used to drawing Godzilla, so for for me, Godzilla is the easiest. Like, Godzilla is one of those characters that I can draw. Uh, I have drawn Godzilla with my eyes closed, and I'm. And only sometimes are the teeth on the opposite side of the paper, but <laughs> but uh, Godzilla is personally the easiest for me. Um, Kong is pretty easy. I got really good at drawing gorillas back in 2005 because I was so hyped for the 2005 King Kong mm -hmm. that I sat up for uh, overnight, like several hours, just drawing gorillas, just going online and finding reference pictures of gorillas. And now I memorized how to draw the skull and face shape of a gorilla. And um, uh, hardest, oh, that's when you get a complicated craft like Mecha King Ghidorah. Uh, I, I, I still... Like whenever I'm at a convention and someone says, someone, and I ask somebody like, oh yeah, you buy the sketchbook, you get a free sketch. Uh, what do you want? And they'll be like, I would like Mecha King Ghidorah, please. And I'm like, cool, 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 cool. Don't mind me. I'm just fashioning a noose over here. Um, <laughs> but um, I think I've got a pretty good idea of how this is going to work. So, so if, if I go back to IDW and, and specifically Godzilla Rules for Earth, were there any ideas that you maybe came close to including, but for some reason weren't able to? 
Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I had, re I had wanted to do from the start is, um, our main character, uh, Lucy was, uh, well, uh, I really wanted her to f have this budding relationship with another main character, uh, Christina. And I wanted the two of them to, I wanted to, uh, for that relationship to grow over the course of the, of the story and to see how that would, how that would play out. But, uh, unfortunately we basically kept getting told, um, uh, no, we need more monsters, more monster fights. Every issue basically has to have a monster fight because we were also under constant threat of being canceled because of, um, I mean, the sales weren't bad. They just weren't where IDW wanted them. But the fans would then rally and get the number, pre order numbers up to the point where eventually IDW just gave up and uh, said, okay, fine, just go. Just go for as long as you want. <laughs> uh, but I really wanted there to at least be one issue where it was just focused on the two of them and their young budding relationship and uh, maybe some kind of monster stuff going on in the background, but it really being about the two of them. And we just never really got to do that. And that uh, made me a little sad, but you know, that's, that's just how it goes. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta pick your battles. Was that a um, editor's choice specifically? Or was that a Toho decision? Oh no, that was an editor. That was, that was our, our, our editor, not even necessarily like you can't do that. It was more that our editor, Bobby Kernow was just like, listen, we got to keep, we got to keep the monster action going because that's, that's kind of the word from, from up top. At least that's the way I remember it. I could be remembering it wrong, but Bobby was very supportive of what we wanted to do. He just, uh, you know, he, he had to acquiesce to what the bosses would request in order to keep the book sale, the, the, the pre-order sales up. Uh, but you know, we made the best, we made the best of it. And I feel like we've got uh, some, some really cute moments between the two of them. I also had this whole plan for, uh, Minila and how, uh, I wanted us to incorporate that character into the story and kind of do like we did with King Caesar and Jet Jaguar and make Minila awesome and make people want to root for Minila because that character kind of gets, Poo pooed a lot in the uh, in the fandom. Yeah, Minya definitely gets a bad rap. I think also for the wrong reasons. Um, <laughs> what was it? Let me ask you this: Were there? Um, what's your general takeaway just from everything with IDW? What would you say your least, uh, your favorite, and least favorite comics were from that series? Uh, does that include stuff that I worked on, or just overall IDW? I would say let's just focus on your work. On my work? Oh, that's hard to say. Uh, there were some moments in Rulers of Earth where, purely from my own perspective, I wasn't really happy with some of my art decisions. Like, some of the things I would try to draw, I'm like, I look back on now, and having grown as an artist, I'm like, oh, that's not great. And that's, I'm not crazy about how that looks, and oh, I wish I could, I could go back in time and smack myself upside the head and say, get an anatomy book! Because I... I have struggled with human characters for a really long time. I thankfully I've gotten considerably better in the last couple of years, but in rulers, you can actively see the transition happen from the first issue towards the final issue that I really am starting to find my groove in drawing, uh, in drawing human characters. What, uh, what would you say makes that challenging for you? Uh, for me personally, the it's simply because I learned how to draw by drawing dinosaurs and monsters and stuff. That was my primary focus for a really long time. And then I tried to jump directly into drawing really, really anime style characters. And that's a mistake because the best anime artists learn how to draw from life first. They learn how to draw... Uh, anatomy and people first and then you can adapt that into sort of an anime style but a lot of uh, young artists and, and especially young anime fans try to jump straight into drawing an anime style but it also uh, it's also difficult because Japanese artists like that's that's baked into their culture into their into their artistic culture in a way that it's not over here this is why you get these how to draw manga books and how to draw anime books that you'll find in half price books for uh, seventy percent uh, uh, markdown, and they 
kind of look like garbage. <laughs> Although somebody, I do remember somebody did say like, I don't like the way Matt draws. His characters look like uh, how to draw a manga book <laughs> characters from uh, 2004. And I'm like, how dare you say something that's 100% true? Uh, <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Matt. How do you how do you handle that kind of criticism? Because like it's see, social media, everybody has access right away to react to stuff. Yeah. And the Godzilla fandom is so insulated. Like it's very easy for you to post something and then immediately get. I mean, I've seen your Facebook wall. I can <laughs> you know, <laughs> crazy sometimes. So my question is, how, how do you handle that criticism? And, and what's what kind of response do you have to do? You prepare for that. Well, one of the advantages of of going to art school, which technically I went to school for fine art, which is not the same thing as uh, illustration, which is kind of one of the reasons why I didn't super know color theory for a long time, <laughs> which my uh, assistant has yet to let me live down. <laughs> um, but uh uh, and and it just color theory is one of those things that uh, the fine art school I went to didn't really focus on because it was a fine arts kind of this idea of like, oh man, but like everything is art, yo. Like I'm gonna cover myself in butter and crawl from one end of Manhattan to the other, which somebody did do once, although I think it was honey. But anyway, that. Uh, but one of the advantages of going to an art school, especially an art school that does not like the fact that you want to be a comic book artist, is you learn to start, you learn to take criticism and learn to tell the difference between, and uh, these are kind of uh, buzzwords nowadays, but you learn to tell the difference between good faith criticism and bad faith criticism. And uh, uh, bad faith criticism is when someone is just, it, it, I would say it's something like cinema sins where it, the uh, yeah where they're like they'll say a bunch of stuff that's provably wrong about a film and then when you call them out on it they'll be like oh we're just doing satire as a defense mechanism as opposed to something like um oh what's a good example uh what was it what's what, what was it called uh 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 oh some uh, oh it's uh honest trailers honest trailers will Sometimes they do stuff that's satirical and jokey. Then other times they'll be like real criticism. They're very famously the uh, director of Kong Skull Island did an Honest Trailers episode where he was like, you want to know what's wrong with Kong Skull Island? He handed them a list and he was like, this doesn't work and this doesn't work and this doesn't work. And it's like, this is the director of the movie. <laughs> so Yeah, that was a great episode. Voight, Voight Roberts was, he was wonderful in that. Um, God, I love it. So let's, let's, Put the, the kaiju aside for a second. Let's talk about your work on uh, the asylum mockbuster of Godzilla King of the Monsters called Monster Island. So how did you get involved in that? And I believe you actually provided them with 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 at least one monster design, but did you give them any additional ones? Uh, yeah, that, that was a really... Uh, how do I put this? <laughs> it was an interesting experience, all things considered. It was a... It, it was fun because the uh, the director was super gung-ho. He was very complimentary of me and my work. But they also work on an extremely tight schedule with extremely limited budget. So trying to, uh, you know, trying to suggest other monsters. Like at a certain point, I was like, oh, I can do all these monsters for you if y'all want, you know. And... Uh, unfortunately they just couldn't get budget approval for that all they could get approval for was me doing this one monster which was the tengu the giant starfish um although i think and i'm not 100 on this but i think they had already started modeling it before i was done with the concept because the final monster model looks like a mix of the director's initial sketches and a little bit of my design but uh, yeah, still, it was a fun process. It was just uh, it was just very hectic because it's like again everything is on this super tight schedule, and uh, you know it just it was just it was just different. It was different from working on a comic or something or working on something that has uh, air to, a room to breathe. Still fun though. So you work on Redman the Kaiju Hunter. Um... How familiar were you with Redman before that? Uh, I was, I had become, I was starting to become familiar with Redman because Subaraya started uploading uh, the episodes onto their YouTube channel. And yep. it sort of became this viral hit. And 
well, I and a couple of friends sort of joked about the idea of, oh man, what if we made like a red man comic book and we're having fun with it. And we're just kind of goofing around. Didn't think much of it beyond that. And then, uh, the publisher I was working with in Japan, Andrew over at phase six, he said, he found the videos, he found the YouTube stuff and he said, man, we got to do a red man comic. <laughs> I'm hoping I can have him on an episode of my own podcast uh, where he and I can maybe talk about the history of working on that uh, comic. But yeah, I was, I was vaguely familiar with it and it, but, but I basically had to become a fan and expert kind of overnight. Once we got the green light or the red light rather. <laughs> I see what you did there. I, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, so I got to ask, you voiced Ultraman Belial for the <laughs> Ultraman Fusion fight game. Like, one, how did you get involved in that? But two, like, what was the process for providing those voiceovers like? What? It's such a... That was such a weird, out-of-nowhere gig. Because So I went to Japan, I think this was late 2016, maybe it was late 2017. It was a couple of years ago. Maybe it was late 2018. Yeah, I think. Uh, and I was over there for Tokyo Comic Con and a couple other things. And I stopped by, I stopped by uh, my publisher's office uh, just to hang out for a minute, sign some books, catch up. I usually bring a giant box of goodies for them from the states. And and uh, Andrew, if I remember correctly, he said, "By the way, I've got a birthday present for you." And I'm like, "What's up?" And he says. Uh, you want to voice an Ultraman character? <laughs> and I'm like, who's it? What's it? What now? Because my uh, the uh, Phase Six does translation work mostly. Like their comic stuff is only one part of their company. Then most of their bread and butter comes from doing translation work. And uh, one of the translation gigs they got was from Bandai. They had worked with Bandai a fair bit before, but they were working on Ultraman Fusion Fight. Uh, and this is for distribution mostly in Indonesia, but also in Malaysia and other places that have a lot of English spe uh, uh, where there's a lot of English being spoken. So they just went ahead and did an English version. And uh, yeah, and Andrew knows that I like to do funny voices. And also uh, the reality is, is, is that a lot of the voice actors for uh, stuff that is recorded in Japan or in Asia uh, usually only some of them are professional voice actors. A lot of them, they're just like, we just need somebody who can speak English. Because <laughs> no one's going to care. <laughs> yeah, that seems very on brand with a lot of productions I'm, I'm familiar with. Yeah. So when they, so what the, how did they how did they actually get you to record the voice itself? Was this done like remotely? Did you go somewhere specifically in the studio? Did you do it over? Like, what's the process like there? Oh, yeah, no, I, uh, we, we went to a recording studio that was uh, in Tokyo. It was this uh, little it was this little space that uh, companies would rent out specifically for stuff like this, either for album recording or for voiceovers for commercials or voiceovers for video games. And there was a couple of reps from Bandai there. And, uh, you know, and, and then what they do is they would hand you a script uh, that Phase 6 had come up with, ha had translated of here's what the characters are going to say. Uh, and sometimes we would make some notes where we're like, well, this is a little awkward in English. So can we rewrite this kind of on the fly to be like this? And, uh, and you know, you just hop in the booth. But what was funny with that game was I kind of wound up voice directing for the day <laughs> because I was the only person who really knew these characters. So I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, um, Magma Sajin is a lot gruffer than that. There, there. If you really want to, I think, I think Magma Sajin. We had a, a a gentleman from the UK. I can't remember who voiced Magma Sajin, but someone with an accent did. And I said, uh, more Cockney, <laughs> more like a street <laughs> tough. Um, if and I remember. Oh, I remember uh, another session we did. I wound up doing voice for the bad guy from Ultraman Rube from Ultraman RB. And because he's kind of a, a, a fancy boy, he's very fancy. And I, I, I started to think he's kind of a dandy a little bit. He's I dresses like a Southern dandy. And I said, I'll voice him like this. And it's like, Oh, <laughs> you poor young ultra boys. Let me show you how it's done. Like I started doing that. But then Belial is like, 
I am Ultraman Belial, and I will destroy you and all of your pets. And, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, so let's talk oh, about the amazing Gamera yeah. Hero box set, right? Um, yeah. So you were credited, obviously you did the artwork for, for, I think, all of it, but you were credited as an associate producer. So talk about your role with that entire set. Uh, so I was originally brought in just as the packaging artist, uh, and I, and the process was somewat fluid because Arrow was still more or less deciding exactly what they wanted to do for the project. So early on, I was kind of like, well, I'll just do illustrations of each monster and we'll make a decision based off of that. Uh, I'll just, I'll just do these portraits basically. And I kept adding stuff to it and adding stuff to it. Uh, but then at a certain point, I asked James, uh, the disc director, you guys, are you guys doing commentary tracks? And he said, yes, we're importing August Ragone's commentaries. We're also going to be importing, uh, uh, we're, we're, or rather, we're going to be getting a couple of new commentary tracks. At the time, I believe David Callett was one of the only new ones they had recorded. And they weren't really planning on doing all of them, just a few. And I'm like, no, 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 you got to do all of them. you got to do all of them. And I said, well, let, at first I said, let me do let me do uh, all three of the Gamera trilogy because I couldn't pick just one. And I'm <laughs> so glad I just went with Guardian of the Universe because, God, that was hard. Like, the process of recording a commentary track, a professional commentary track, like, if you want to do, like, what David Callett and August and all these other people do, if you want to do that, you got to do your research, you got to hunker down, and you just got to, and you got to do your, re you got to, you got to interview people. You've got to dig up sources. You've got to get people to translate stuff for you. And it's especially hard for stuff like the Gamera movies because there's not a whole lot of English language resources yeah. like there is for Godzilla. Yeah. Huh. But yeah. Uh, and, and so one of the things I, I started doing was I started making recommendations like, well, you guys need to reach out to Steve Rifle and I got to Chesky. And also I've got my buddy Kyle Yount from uh, Kaiju Cast. He could do a uh, Gamera 2 commentary. And I, I uh, and uh, Richard Pusateri, I gave the unenviable task of doing a commentary for Super Monster. God rest. I mean, that's just. <laughs> yeah, it was a rough one. He, he did his best, though. He. No, I, just the movie it, itself. I mean, that's uh, that's a tough uh, one. That and uh, Zegra are very just. Oof. Well, the commentary for Zegra is a lot of fun as well. More interesting uh, than the movie, that's for sure. <laughs> that is one of my favorite MST three Ks of all time. Is the Zegra? Well, yeah, you can't you can't go wrong with MST. I don't think. Um, uh, not all the time. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me ask you another question related to that. Um, were there any items that you wanted to originally include in the Arrow box set that you just, for whatever reason, weren't able to pull together at the end? Uh, we were kind of rapid firing certain things like uh, there is a there are a couple of direct to video documentaries I wanted us to include, and we never really uh, we couldn't get approval for those because there's a lot of uh, there's just sometimes copyright problems with that stuff like technically the documentary might need approval from the guys who made it there's just certain things that come with japanese copyright law that means you can't do everything you want to do which is uh, true for any project uh but yeah there was there was stuff where i was like oh maybe we should include this in fact i i ripped a couple of vhs tapes uh that uh a buddy of mine helped me out with and uh I, I like stayed over their place for like three hours while getting these VHSs turned into digital files and then found out like, oh, we can't use them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, uh, trying to think of some of the other, uh, some of the other projects that uh, happened. Um, yeah. And then of course, you know, everybody wanted the Gamera 2010 proof of concept trailer to be included, yep. but for whatever reason, Katakawa said, "No, nah, we can't. We can't clear that." Do you feel like Katakawa is fairly easy to work with? I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there about Toho and Criterion, and so you know, it, it seems to me like they just kind of gave you guys a lot of the stuff that you wanted. Is that that is that accurate? 
I mean, really, it wasn't very often we heard no. Like, those are some of the only instances we heard no. Like, everything else was pretty much uh, green light, green light, green light. I, I don't think they had any notes on the artwork. Um, and I think it's simply because uh, Kadokawa doesn't have the same... Gamera is not the same a uh, giant uh, uh, pop culture cash cow the way Godzilla is. Because Toho has, like, this very specific ethos regarding Godzilla where you have to treat it a certain way and you have to go through these approval processes and you have to do this and you have to do this. And with uh, with Katokawa, they're kind of like, uh, we bought this franchise. Y'all can do what you want with it. <laughs> um, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, there were so many bootleg Gamera DVDs for so long was because they either didn't have the resources or didn't have the time to pursue, uh, you know, or, or even the inclination to really pursue like cracking down on these Gamera bootlegs you'd see at half price books or something. The second half price books reference I've made. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, Kanakawa by comparison is really, was really easy to work with. Uh, and, and, and in fairness, uh, Toho for me anyway, has gotten a lot easier to work with because I've worked with them so many times. I know like what they look for. So I try to, I try to anticipate that. So Ricardo Delgado actually talked about that. One of our panels, he, he was given a sort of Bible, if you will, of things that mm -hmm. he could and couldn't do in, in creating Godzilla or drawing Godzilla. Did yeah. Toho ever give you anything like that for, for your stuff? Uh, I, they probably did that to IDW directly. Like they probably gave it to Chris Mowry, but I never saw anything like that. Um, uh, most of what I got was just, uh, reference photos from magazines and stuff that they would kind of pull out of uh, their archives and things like that. If I, uh, funnily enough, a lot of the other artists had to basically audition to work on Godzilla. Uh, they would have to do like a, 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 a couple of pages of like a short mini comic of like here's Godzilla and here's Hedera and they're fighting and stuff but then uh I never got that request <laughs> Toho never asked me to do that and I don't know if that was simply an oversight or if they were like oh yeah we know that kid from uh, DeviantArt uh just let him do what he wants um <laughs> I don't think that's true but that would be very funny if that was the case so I know you also got um some recent uh trimmers blu-ray had some of your artwork so yeah. how, did, how did you get involved in that? And, and what does, do you have any specific um, affinity for that franchise? The first Trimmers, by the way, is, is awesome. Highly recommended for anybody that for some reason hasn't yet checked it out. Oh yeah. Like uh, Tremors is one of those movies that I, I saw when I was pretty young and I think it really freaked me out because of the whole thing of like, there are these monsters under the earth that can hear your vibrations and can burrow through the dirt to follow you and, and suck you underground. Um, and it really wasn't until I was an adult that I re realized it was a comedy because um, <laughs> I went back to rewatch it. And, uh, but yeah, I love that. I love the original, of course. Uh, I think the sequels are fun. They're kind of, kind of goofy and silly. And uh, I don't think any of them are necessarily bad. Uh, granted, I haven't seen any of the more recent ones um, where they've gone all CGI with the monsters and that just kind of... Uh, I'm going to tell you, just just don't. Sorry sorry for any fans <laughs> of the franchise, but you're, you're doing yourself a disservice if you even bother. Let, let me ask yeah. you this. Uh, you, you worked on Adventure Time. Can you talk about that for a second? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was asked to do a both a short story for Adventure Time from Boom Studios, as well as a cover for one of the issues. I did sort of a faux Japanese ukiyo-e style for the cover I did. And then I did uh, a short story written by my buddy Brandon Zern. Uh, and he... Uh, he wrote this story about Billy, the character of, uh, of the, the greatest hero to ever live. And it was kind of a really dark, 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 dark story because <laughs> that show gets super dark sometimes. So we had fun with that. I have a couple of last questions as we wrap up. Um, what what yeah. was the process of the kaiju combat designs? Like, can you just walk us through? Did, were you given specific things to, to pull from? Did they tell you, hey, we really want this type of monster? So when you say Kaiju Combat, you're specifically talking about the uh, the video game that never came out, right? Correct. Okay, good. Because there's a new Kaiju Combat, which is the Ultraman mobile game they're working on. <laughs> um, 
which I'm also involved with. Uh, so the that that process was uh, basically a bunch. You, you would you would have people who would who would get their monsters adapted for the game and so it was a collaborative process it was not like a uh, uh pay us and we will just translate your monster directly into the game we try to make it a, into a design process and be like well this is probably going to function better and you know if we can maybe focus the design or rework the design from the ground up and for the most part people were really chill about it and were very uh, open to the collaborative process only a couple of times did we really piss people off because you know we were changing their monsters and uh and unfortunately you're kind of like yeah but your initial design doesn't really work so we want to we want to take a what about it we like and make it work in a in a in a nice focused design but like i said for the most part people were really chill and really uh really cool about it so I know you did some work with Transformers and I think you even created like what four of your own original Transformers, is that correct? I uh, I did do that. Um yeah, I I did I made the Raptoricons for a Transformers short story that was in the official collector's magazine. And uh that was something that the it, a, a, a fan had commissioned uh, what would Blue from Jurassic World look like if she were a Predacon. So I designed that, showed it to the head of the collector's club. He said, oh, we got to make that into a character. And uh, like a year or so later, that was when he asked me to kind of do this short story and wrote that completely off the cuff had to go back and rewrite a good chunk of it because I didn't realize that I was writing in a complete in the wrong continuity. <laughs> I was writing in the beast wars continuity and not in like the classics generations continuity that they wanted me to work in, but it wasn't that hard. I was able to kind of go through and, and uh, f fix some of that, but yeah, um, I really enjoyed making them and uh, at least two people cosplayed as those characters. <laughs> so <laughs> that was really fun to see. You're were you able to retain rights for any of your your creations? I mean, or were they folded back into the IPs? Uh, pretty much, they they like it, it, it's basically understood that if you're making a character for a a a license property, you are it belongs to them, and that's kind of there's not a whole lot you can do about that. I mean, if you really want to get aggressive. It's just, for me, I would rather, if I want to own the rights to a character, I'd rather be a character I made for something original as opposed to something that just gets folded into this broader IP, if that makes sense. No, absolutely makes sense. Um, yeah. Matt, what would you say, what, what piece of, of work, whether it's your writing or whether it's the art itself, um, what would you say you're most proud of? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> the piece I usually come back, hold on phone's getting a little low on power uh i would say that the piece that i'm uh, the individual single piece i usually think about about me being most proud of is my rage across time cover which yeah. i did in that sort of faux ukiyo-e style with godzilla sort of curling in on himself and there's all the waves and the fire and that one i'm very proud of and it took me about a week to make that but that is kind of my go-to piece for like I feel like this is just, I don't feel like I'm ever going to match this. Uh, that's, that's it. Throw in the towel, Matt, you're done. <laughs> that, that would be right to pick one. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for just everything. We're kind of coming to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't you talk about the piece of art that you've been, you've been working on for the past hour or so? Uh, well, uh, uh, this is a, this is my take on Gamera. This is something that I had been working on. Uh, it was in my sketchbook earlier i had done some little uh some little doodles of uh eh, whatever um <laughs> hard to line that up i had done some doodles of of kind of what i would want to do for my own version of gamera and uh i started expanding on this idea because my friend sophie campbell who is the current artist on uh teenage Mutant ninja turtles for idw she's a big kaiju fan she also did the destroy all monsters poster in the criterion set uh, and she's eternally uh, angry and vengeful at me for doing the Gamera set <laughs> because she really <laughs> loves Gamera. But she and I started doing a challenging each other to our own versions of various monsters. And uh, I really uh, was liking how this version of Gamera is coming out. I, I, I tried to make sure not to give him 
the single rows of teeth that Gamera always have. I wanted the teeth to be basically made out of the uh, uh, out of the beak. Although uh, you can't see because his mouth's full of fire, but in the back of his throat, I gave him these loggerhead turtle teeth that like grab onto stuff, um, which is are a nightmare if you ever Google that. But uh, yeah, you know, it's just it's just my version of Gamera. I really wanted to focus more on the beak, but still give him that intense glare i i like the idea of gamera being a very old monster kind of like how they interpreted uh a legendary godzilla which i'm a little salty about because i'm like man legendary godzilla took gamera's thing as being this ancient animistic god monster that protects the earth's balance and crap so yeah so that's that's uh, it in a nutshell i'm glad i got to i got i got the line art done at least i mean i normally I'd throw on a little uh grayscale or something but i'll probably do that later that looks great. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Where can people find you? I mean, assuming they don't know where to find your art, where can they look you up? Let me pop this sucker out so I can talk to the sure. people. Hold on. I think I destroyed I think I destroyed my phone. Why? Why? Okay, hi. Um I, oh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, they can find me over at mattfrankart.net. That's my main website. Um, let's see. I've got the gigantic cast on iTunes, which, uh, my assistant Kasten, uh, is in the most recent episode where we talk about colossal slight content warning. It's a little bit of an intense episode. Uh, let me think, uh, twitch stream in an hour. I'm doing t a Twitch stream in an hour, which is twitch.tv slash mattzilla85. I remembered it this time, but yeah, mattfrankart.net is the main hub for everything. I'm also on rage select, uh, just about every week screaming about video games extremely inappropriately um am i missing anything else uh your social media is uh social media is like you know spankzilla85 on twitter very tasteful um mattzilla85 on instagram and go pre-order the tremor set and awesome. uh yeah that's that's about all i can think of well, thank you so much for joining uh, Kaiju Masterclass, Matt. We really appreciate your time. And thank you to the audience for sticking with us for this last hour. Uh, just so you're aware, Tab Murphy will be interviewed by Steve Rifle about uh, Godzilla 2. And that'll be coming up right after this. My name is Matt Parmley, by the way. I'm one of the organizers for Kaiju Masterclass, also co-host of the Kaiju Transmissions podcast. And just want to say thank you very much to everybody out there.